Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship with the First Presbyterian Church in Hayes, Kansas. I'm Becky Rogowski, and I'm the Generations and Faith Together coordinator here at First Pres. Our pastor, Celeste, was able to take some time off this week. Our presbytery recognized that pastors and staff have been going nonstop since mid-March, when we were forced online after having to close our sanctuaries to those of you whom we love so dearly. Our Synod has made a sermon series available the fourth Sunday of the month. Today we are privileged to have the stated clerk, Brian Ellison, giving our message. Our larger church is in the midst of the first ever virtual General Assembly. The outgoing co-moderators are working on a full worship service for next Sunday. We hope that allows Celeste more time off, and also I'll be taking a small break as well. We are so lucky to be a connectional church with so many wonderful resources. Today we will also hear from Laura Schoff at First Call for Help. She will talk to us about the additional need for donations for Backpack for Kids. The pandemic has been rough on them as well. Their annual distribution will take place here at First Pres the first week in August. I will be asking for a handful of our amazing volunteers when we get closer to help with setup. We have a great partnership with them, and I'm hopeful after hearing her today that we can help them bring in some additional funds. As always, just make sure your donation is marked as being intended for backpacks. It's tradition here at First Press to start our worship service by bringing in the light of Christ. During virtual church, we've done so by lighting a small candle so that you can do the same at home. If you have a candle available, I invite you into worship by lighting it now. Prepare your hearts for worship. Happy Sunday before the 4th of July. Happy Independence Day. Show us your ways, O Lord. Lead us in your truth and teach us. Open, Open our, our eyes, minds, and hearts to know your will and to follow it. it. Reveal your vision for us and keep us focused and faithful to what you would have us to do. Bring, Bring us together, together to, to worship and work for your purpose and move us forward into your future. Amen. Amen. Please join me in prayer. You long for us to show mercy, compassion, and welcome just as you do. Help us to open our hearts to all of your children, even as we were welcomed into your kingdom of love. In the name of Jesus, amen.
If we say we have no sin, we do only deceive ourselves, and we leave no room for God's truth to, to dwell in us. When we confess our sin, we are able to experience the abundant mercy of God's everlasting grace, right here and right now. Before God, with the people of God, let us confess, confess to our brokenness. Let us pray. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God, your will is for all creation to have abundant life. We confess that sometimes we do not understand your way, and often we prefer to walk our own way. We confess that sometimes we have received your good gift, then allowed that gift to become our God. We confess that it is easier to ask you to bless what we want to do rather than to ask for the courage to do what you are blessing. Forgive our hard hearts and closed minds, our selfish ambition and cultural bondage. Free us to follow your way of justice, peace, and love. Gracious God, silence every voice in us but your own, that we may be your faithful people, we pray in the name of the one who lived every moment in obedience to you, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please join me in the assurance of forgiveness. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, from before the beginning until long beyond our imaginations. God's love endures, knows that you are forgiven, loved, and free. Thanks be to God. Amen. Fast peace! Fast peace! No, come on! Good morning. Peace be with you. And the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. May the peace be with you. Good morning. Peace be with you. Good morning. Peace be with you. Good morning. And peace, fellow disciples. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Hi, my name is Brian Ellison. I'm stated clerk of the Synod of Mid-America, which is a Presbyterian council that covers uh, all the Presbyterian churches in Kansas and Missouri and uh, six counties in Western Illinois. It is really a pleasure and a privilege to be joining you for worship this morning. And I know there's churches throughout the Synod and in fact throughout the country who are using this video sermon today. And we're grateful for the chance, grateful to be able to support you and your congregation and its ministry as you try to uh, continue to worship together in this virtual way. Uh, we especially uh, thank your pastors, and I hope you will thank them too for all the hard work and good work they're doing in these very difficult times. Let us tend now to God's Word as it comes to us in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, chapter 22, the first 14 verses. Listen for God's Word. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. And then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship. 
and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built there an altar and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This Bible story, the story of the near sacrifice of Isaac, is one of the first ones I remember learning in Sunday school. I don't know how old I was exactly when it came up in the lesson plans, uh, whether it was in Grandma Nutt's kindergarten class. She wasn't really my grandma. She was the mother of my dad's brother's wife, but close enough. The class where the stories got acted out by paper figures stuck to a flannel sheet. Or maybe it was Mrs. Capps' first grade class where we got stars on the chart for remembering Bible verses like the Lord will provide, which, to be honest, I actually was reading off of the chalkboard where they had been erased from the previous week but not fully washed away. It's a Bible story I found that a lot of people who grew up in church remember. A person can get nostalgic hearing these old stories like this one about faith and commitment, about devotion and sacrifice, can't we? The first time I preached on this text was when, in my first call as a pastor in Parkville, Missouri, for the reading of this story, we had a father and his eight-year-old son enact portions of this text, walking up the aisle of the church, carrying a pile of wood for the altar, pausing at the front as the son, his only son, whom we all loved, knelt and waited. And that is the moment that I thought about this sacred text, what I can't believe I hadn't thought about before, that I hadn't thought of when I heard it as a five-year-old, that I hadn't thought of since. This is a terrible story. I looked at that dad standing there, an elder, a businessman, standing there with his hand on his son's shoulder. I looked at the sweet face of the kid who came to the early service in his soccer uniform on Sundays when he had a game. And I thought, why in God's name did Grandma Nutt put this on a flannel graph? How did parents and pastors even let children hear this story? Abraham is supposed to be a hero of God's people, but what kind of father would raise a knife to their son, no matter what some voice from heaven told him? And what kind of God, frankly, would ask a father to do such a thing, regardless of how the story is supposed to end? It is terrible. It's a story of brokenness, not beauty. It's a story of anguish, violence, horror. From the first time Abraham hears the Lord's voice, the story walks toward death, death looming like a mountain. Even if there is sun rising behind that mountain of death, Abraham, Isaac, you and I, we're walking toward the mountain in its shadow. And I am not sure the ending feels so much like resolution as a pause. A moment frozen. Isaac is still alive, 
but we are wounded. This year, this moment feels immersed in anguish. There is fear in the air, fear of a virus we cannot see, but which is wreaking real pain and suffering, sometimes in people we love. There is holy anger at the murders of black people in this country and deep soul searching about the white supremacy that since our founding has underlay every aspect of our country's culture and politics and law. Protests in our streets, violent or not, are designed to unsettle us and we need some unsettling. So accustomed have we become to ignoring the truth before our eyes, defying our senses, even our conscience. And whether it is police sirens or pangs of conscience or the beeping of a loved one's respirator that's keeping us awake in this moment, waking up is precisely what is needed. Waking up, after all, is the difference between death and life. You see, the story of Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac isn't just terrible, it is also true. And the more I read this story now, as an adult, I see Abraham not just as the hundred-year-old man with a long beard and sandals on the flannel board, not even as the symbol of God's ancient people. I see him as me. I see him as you. It's, of course, the story of a man who is devoted. That's what our Sunday school teachers wanted us to see. A man who, like us, in our stumbling and imperfect ways, tries to do the right things, tries to hear God's voice and do what God wants us to do. Abraham will go to great lengths to do what, in a moment, he perceives to be right. And I bet you will, too. An act of extravagant generosity or unusual boldness. We can be courageous people. But we also, like Abraham, can be impulsive people, can't we? And I refuse to believe that whoever first put pen to paper or stylus to papyrus or whatever grandparent first told this story around a fire to their grandchildren 3,000 years ago, I refuse to believe that they didn't know how barbaric it was to suggest that Abraham offering to kill his son was an act of devotion. They knew it was a terrible story when they told it. And maybe the best way for us to hear this story is as a cautionary tale, a word of warning about how we, in our acts of devotion or in our acts of impulse, sometimes do exactly the wrong thing. I see it in my own life and in the lives of those around me. Maybe our desire to keep the peace leads us to tolerate and defend a system that brings death and calamity to people of color, silence paving the way for death. Or maybe our desire to be generous with our own individual acts of compassion or care blinds us to the need for systemic changes that would lift generations and neighborhoods from persistent poverty. Or maybe our desire to worship and share in God's gift of fellowship and community leads to our giving ourselves permission to gather too soon, putting public health and the lives of friends and strangers at risk. Abraham was devoted to God, but faith was never designed to operate without sense. Following never meant putting on a blindfold. Obedience can never use ignorance as an excuse. Let's be honest, that's how well-meaning missionaries ended up establishing colonial rule over nations and peoples, forming patterns of dependence and oppression. That's how talk of morals and values kept LGBTQ people out of the church and away from the gospel and sometimes from the Thanksgiving dinner table and the love of their families. And that's how Abraham found himself walking toward the mountain to kill his son. When I hear the angel of the Lord crying out as Abraham raises the knife, I don't hear appreciation in the angel's voice. I hear terror. Wait, what are you doing? 
Wake up, Abraham. Get a hold of yourself, man. Abraham didn't so much pass the test as he forced God to cancel the exam. All right, all right, I know you fear God. Now untie your son for God's sake. And only then does this story become bearable. Only when the story's trajectory is disturbed, only when Abraham does not do the thing that in obedience he thought he was called to do, only when he changes his plan does this story become one of not death, but life. It would be many centuries after these stories were first told that Paul would write to the Romans about death and life in their bodies. He wrote in another shadow of death, this one a cross-shaped shadow, remembering one who had offered his own body, another innocent lamb, another beloved son. And to a group of Christians who dare to say they've been changed, transformed by God's power, to a group of believers who are striving to worship God not only by building altars in certain places, but in how they live, Paul writes... Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And present your members to God as instruments of righteousness, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. Our story, yours and mine I mean, is set in a place of anguish and brokenness, of violence and death. And it would be so easy to let the sin that is all around us exercise dominion over us too, to be ruled by it. And what Paul names for us is that it doesn't have to be that way, that we have control, we have agency over these bodies of ours, our members, our hands and feet, our minds and our mouths. They are tools or they are weapons. They are instruments of wickedness or they are instruments of righteousness. They are knives for slaying our nation's children or they are knives for cutting loose the ropes that bind them. They are torches for destroying the homes and lives of our neighbors, or they bear the flames that will burn down walls that divide and structures that imprison. Which will it be, people of God? Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, the scripture says, for it will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. In Jesus Christ, God has delivered an expansive, powerful grace, stronger than law, freedom from bondage, an end to humanity laid on altars to be sacrificed, and the beginning of humanity set free for transformation of a broken world. And at the end of the encounter on the mountaintop, we are told that God provides a ram caught in a thicket. A ram... Not a lamb, like Abraham had told Isaac God would provide. A ram, older, less perfect. In a way, it's a bit of a messy ending to a story that we can see was pretty messy to begin with, just like our stories. The story moves from death to life. But the life it moves to, well, it isn't easy. It isn't idealized. It isn't complete. It just continues. And it will be up to Abraham and Isaac to decide its next steps. And whether the future will hold more violence and terror or something different. That is life. And that is our story too. We stand there, a moment frozen, wounded, but alive. So friends, given the grace now to go back down the mountain, how will we use our tools, our weapons? Will they be instruments of wickedness or of righteousness? 
what will you and I do to follow God out of the shadow and work to bring the world from death to life? Please join me in prayer. God of welcome, we thank you that you are always ready, wanting to welcome us, always waiting to spend time with us and hear what we want to bring to you in prayer. This prayer could be an endless list and there will be situations missed and people escaping our attention but we know that you are able to see beyond our limited memories and hold all that pains creation with us and for us. We are so consumed by the effects of a virus that many situations have gone unnoticed. We pray now for those in our world who feel forgotten, for refugees in camps, not only worried when their lives might take a better turn, but now also fearful of this invisible danger. For men, women, and children behind closed doors, living with danger and torment at the hands of people who profess to love them. For people living with life-limiting conditions, relying on reduced levels of care, fearful of catching this virus, as they fear their treatment will be limited. For those in the background, within caregiving services, the cleaners and janitorial staff, the administrators and managers, doing what is needed to ensure hospitals and care homes run smoothly and safely. For places of conflict where, with attention elsewhere, dangers are increased and tensions raised and where deaths continue unheeded. So many places, so many concerns, Lord. Thank you that we can bring them to you. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, Hayes Presbyterian Church family. When someone asks me why I appreciate the Hayes First Presbyterian Church, I think of its building, the minister and staff, the music, but most of all, I think of the church family. When I think about the building, I think about sitting in the chapel or the sanctuary and seeing the light stream through the gorgeous windows. Then I turn toward the front of the sanctuary and I see the amazing organ pipes, the cross hanging over us, and the dove descending. And it's easy to feel the presence of God there. We've opened our doors to people in the community, the daycare that helps working mothers, <clears throat> the parenting class, the concerts. We're blessed that we have a church building that we can share with others in the community. We have a wonderful minister who cares deeply for others and is passionate about her work, as is Becky and the other staff members. You can tell by the way they work that they are dedicated to serving the Lord and to serving others in our church family. They're always there to help or guide us in the right direction on our journey. 
For music in our church, we are truly blessed to have Tom and our organ. He can make that organ sing and make marvelous music that thrills my soul. I appreciate the choir that comes together each week and blends our voices together as we lead the congregation and inspire the service. But the church isn't just the building, the music, the minister and staff. The church is the people, we the people. We come from different backgrounds, different schooling, different politics, but we come together to praise and serve our Lord. We serve God by serving one another in the community, in our church, in the world. Remember how we tied blankets for the Western Kansas Child Advocacy Center? How we donate food to the food pantry and school supplies? Remember the stocking or the mitten and scarf tree that we help keep the children warm in winter? And the volunteers that help out with the service? Oh my, remember the apple pie making days? I bet a lot of you have memories from that. And this is just naming a few of the ways that we serve in our community. I think about the Palm Sunday that we all brought coats and sweaters and laid them in the aisle as if we were laying our cloaks out for Jesus to come through to Jerusalem. And then we dedicated all of them and gave them away. I see members in our church serving one another by bringing them to church, by driving them to a doctor's appointment, by being there in their to help someone in their grief, and rejoicing with someone that's celebrating a special occasion. I look at our congregation and I see the children that have grown up here in this church. And I see that they are brave young adults now. I think of the older, um, more experienced members in our church. And I think about how much I've learned from them about Christ through their actions and through their words of wisdom. I also think of those who have already gone to meet their Heavenly Father. And I can still feel their presence here in things this church does. I get a feeling of pride and love when I think about the Hayes First Presbyterian Church because of all the fond memories I have of us working together as a family and praising and serving our God and King. Hi, I'm Laura Show from First Call for Help and the project coordinator for Backpacks for Kids. I'm here in the conference room where all the backpacks and hygiene bags are packed for Ellis County students in need. Last year, we provided backpacks for 671 students in grades pre-K through high school. Due to the COVID-19, donations have been slower coming in and compared to this time last year, we are down $2,500. Unfortunately, we're running low on supplies and the donations to purchase them. I understand that many people need to stay home due to the pandemic, but I'm asking if possible for you to make a donation to Backpacks for Kids so that we may purchase the items needed to fill the backpacks. If you are able and choose to help out, you may send your donation to First Call for Help and in the memo of your check, please write Backpacks for Kids or B4K. I wish you could see all the happy kids when they come to pick up their backpacks in August. There is such a gratifying feeling knowing that you helped fulfill their need. Thanks so much for your consideration of donating to Backpacks for Kids and have a blessed day.
Please join me in an attitude of prayer for the prayer of dedication. Lord, we bring to you our offerings, our money, our time, and ourselves. Not as payment for something, but out of adoration and thanksgiving for all that we have received. Take what we offer and who we are. Bless them to the work of the church and your kingdom. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we rejoice in the love that you continue to show us. Help us to remember the cost of that love, your life, your ministry, your death, and your resurrection. Even when the teaching stories seem barbaric and terrible, help us find our place in bringing forth your kingdom of love, mercy, peace, and justice. We are mindful that our faith needs to operate with logic. Like you, our own stories are messy and incomplete, but we're fortunate that they're continuous. So now it's up to us to go down that mountain and choose our tools. Amen. Oh,